Hi there, I'm going to read chapter 14 of Lila and Inquiry into Morals by Robert M. Frisick. Lila looked around at where they were. Ahead of them was a long, long bridge. It stretched out way over to what looked like the other shore of a big lake they were on. A lot of cars were moving on the bridge, probably going into New York City, she thought. They were close now. Other boats were around them on moorings in the water, but no one seemed to be on board them. Everything looked empty and deserted. It looked like everyone had just gone off and left. Where was everybody? It was like the river was coming down here. It was too quiet. What had happened this afternoon? She couldn't remember very well. She got frightened about something. The wind and the noise, and then she fell asleep. And now she was here. Why? What was she doing here, she wondered. She didn't know. Another town somewhere, another man, another night coming on. It was going to be a long night. The captain came back and gave her a funny look and said, Help me get the dinghy in the water. I can do it myself, but it's easier with two. He took her over to the mast and asked her if she knew how to use a winch. She said yes. Then he hooked a line from the mast into the dinghy, which was lying upside down on the deck in front of them, and told her to start cranking. She did, but it was heavy, and she could see he didn't like the way she was doing it. But she kept on doing it, and after a long time the dinghy was hanging in the air from the line and the captain swung it over the side of the boat. He told her to lower it slowly. She let out the line in the winch. Slowly, he said. She let it out more slowly, and the captain held his hands out to guide the dinghy into the water. Then he turned and said, that's good. At least she did one thing right. He even smiled a little. Maybe tonight wouldn't be so bad. Lila went below, and from her suitcase got her old towel and her last change of clothes and her blow dryer and makeup. She wrapped a bar of soap from the sink into the washcloth to take with her. When she got on deck again, the captain had a little ladder hooked to the side of the boat so they could step down to the dinghy. She went down and got in, and then he followed with some canvas tote bags. She wondered what these were for. He hardly had to row at all. It was just a little way to the shore, where there were some wooden posts sticking out of the water and a rickety-looking wooden dock, and a white building next to it. Back of the building was a hill that went up to a town, it looked like. Inside the white building, a man told them where the showers were. The captain paid him for the mooring and the showers. Then they went down a long hallway, and she went through the ladies' door. Inside was a sort of a dark, dingy shower and a wooden bench just outside. She had to look for a long time for the light switch. She turned on the shower and let it warm up and then took off her clothes and put them on the bench. The shower was good and hot. That was good. Sometimes in these places all you get is cold water. She stepped into it and it felt good. It was the first shower since the karma had been at Troy. She never seemed to get enough showers. Boats aren't clean. Men aren't clean either. She cleaned herself extra well where the captain had been at her last night. He needed someone like her. He smelled like a truck engine. That shirt he was wearing, it looked like he hadn't changed it in weeks. She'd be doing him a favor to go with him to Florida. He didn't know how to take care of himself. She could take care of him. She didn't want to get involved with him, though. She didn't want to get involved with anybody. After a while, they want to get involved, like Jim. That's when the trouble begins. Lila dried herself with the towel and started to dress. Her blouse and skirt were wrinkled, but the wrinkles would shake out. She found a plug-in by a mirror next to the wooden bench and plugged in her blow dryer and held it to her hair. Manhattan was close now. If Jamie was there, he'd take care of everything. It would be so good to see him again. Maybe. You never know about him. He might not be there. And then she was in trouble. She didn't know what she would do then. She didn't want to think about it. She remembered now she told the captain she was going to cook the supper. That's what he bought those canvas tote bags for, to carry the food. Maybe if she'd made him a really good meal, he would take her all the way to Florida. She put on her mascara slowly and carefully, and when she was done, she walked down the hall, and around a corner there was the captain, waiting. As she walked toward him, she could see he looked better now. He was washed and shaved, and he changed that shirt. Outside it had gotten dark. They walked under some street lights along the street up a hill. Some people walked by and didn't look up. It didn't seem like a little town. It seemed more like part of the city. The street wasn't very wide and was sort of dirty and depressing the way big cities get. When they got into the town, she looked in some store windows and saw there wasn't much to look at. She thought she smelled french fries, but she didn't see any McDonald's or Burger King or any place like that around. Would she ever like some french fries? She was starving. Maybe they could buy some, she thought. But the trouble is they'd get all cold by the time they got to the boat. 
Maybe she could cook some. At the supermarket, the prices were high. She got two expensive filet mignons and big Idaho potatoes and oil to make french fries from and some chocolate pudding for dessert and some bread for toast in the morning and some eggs and some butter and some bacon and some milk. As she bent over to pick up the milk, a shopping cart bumped into her. Lila said, oh, I'm sorry. It wasn't her fault, but the woman who looked like she worked for the store just gave her a mean look and didn't excuse herself in any way. Lila got enough groceries to fill two bags. She was starving. She liked to buy food anyway. She probably wouldn't get to eat most of it. But you could never tell. Maybe she and the captain would get along tonight. They could go shopping in New York. She needed a lot of things. When she finished filling the shopping cart, she went to the checkout counter and saw that the checkout lady was the same lady who bumped into her, with the same mean look on her face. She reminded Lila of her mother. Lila asked as nicely as she could. If they could use the shopping cart to take the groceries back to the boat, it would be a lot easier than just carrying those tote bags, but the answer was no. Lila looked at the captain, but didn't say anything. He just paid without any expression. They each picked up a bag of groceries and started on their way out the door, when suddenly there was a loud, Ow! And then, You let go of me! And then, I'll tell my mother! Lila turned and saw the store lady had her hand on a black girl's collar, and the girl was hitting at her and shouting, Let go! Let go! I'll tell my mother! I told you to stay out of here, the store lady said. The girl looked like she was about 10 or 12 years old. Let's go, the captain said. But Lila heard herself say, Leave her alone. Don't get into it, the captain said. I can come in here if I want to, the girl shouted. You can't tell me what to do. Leave her alone, Lila said. The woman looked at her in astonishment. This is our store, she said. Jesus Christ, let's go, the captain said. The woman still didn't let go of the girl. Lila exploded. Just leave her alone or I'll call the police. The woman let go of the girl. The girl ran past Lila and the captain through the doorway of the store. The store woman glared at her. Then she glared at Lila. But there was nothing she could do now. It was over. Lila and the captain went out. Outside, the girl looked at her and did a quick little smile and then skipped away. What the hell was that all about, the captain said. She made me mad. Everything makes you mad. I have to do that, Lila said. Now I'll feel fine all night. At a liquor store, they bought two-fifths of blended and two quarts of mix and a bag of ice. They were really loaded down now as they walked down the narrow street to the little white house where the boat was. What did you get into that argument for, the captain asked. It wasn't any of your business. People are so mean to kids, Lila said. I would have thought you might have enough problems of your own, the captain said. She didn't say anything, but it felt good. She always felt better after she lost her temper like that. She didn't know why, but she always did. As they walked down the river, the captain didn't say a word. He was mad. That was all right, she thought. He'd get over it. At the dock, it was so dark, the dinghy was hard to see. She had to watch her step. She didn't want to drop all this food. The captain set his bag full of groceries down on the dock and untied the dinghy. Then he told Lila to get in. Then he handed everything to her. And then he got in himself. With all the bags between them, it was hard for him to row, so he took just one oar and paddled it on one side and then the other. As she looked back, she could see that the big, long bridge was like a shadow, all lit up from behind. With the light in the sky from New York, it was so beautiful. She put her hand in the water, and it felt warm. Suddenly, she felt really good. She knew they would go to Florida together. It was going to be a good night. When they reached the dark side of the boat, the captain held the dinghy steady while Lila climbed up the ladder. Then in the dark, he handed her the tote bags full of groceries again, and she set them on the dock. Then, while he climbed aboard and tied off the dinghy to the boat, she carried the bags down below. She pushed a light switch on the side of what looked like an overhead light, and it worked, although it wasn't very bright. She took the bottles of whiskey and mix out of the tote bag and stored the extra mix and ice in the ice box. The rest of the food she took out of the bags so she could get her shower stuff. She got it all out and went over and put it in her suitcase on the pilot berth except for a towel which was damp. She hung that on the edge of the pilot berth to dry. The captain said to come up and hold the flashlight. She went up and held it while he opened up a wooden cover in the deck and reached way down inside. First he pulled out a pile of old rope, then some hose and an old anchor, then some wire, and then an old rusted iron bowl with four legs and a grill over it. He held it up to the light of the flashlight. Hibachi, he said, 
having used it since Lake Superior. There's some charcoal down on the pilot berth, meaning go get it. She went down to the berth and found the bag of charcoal and handed it back up. At least he was talking again. From the companionway, she watched him pour the charcoal from the bag. You just go where you feel like with this boat, don't you, she said. Nobody to give you any orders. Nobody to argue with. That's right, he said. Now pass up the kerosene that's behind the chart table there, in that little shelf, right behind where I am. He reached around and pointed to it. She got it and handed it to him. I'm going to start making french fries, Lila said, if you tell me where the pots and pans are. In back of the chart table, deep inside one of those bins, the captain said, just pull off the cover and you'll see them. Lila turned on the electric light over the chart table and found a deep bin where a dozen or so different types of pots and pans were dumped together in a cluttered jumble. The bin was at the back of the counter, so that the only way to reach them was to lie on her stomach on top of the chart table and hang her arm down inside the rectangular hole and fish. The fishing for pans made a tremendous clanging racket. She hoped the noise would impress on the captain the condition of this housekeeping. There wasn't any deep fryer. She felt for a large frying pan and pulled it out. It was a good stainless steel pan, almost new, but it wasn't deep enough for cooking oil. She went back in the bin and clanged around some more, and this time came out with a deep pot and a matching lid. That should work. I don't suppose you have a wire basket for french fries, she said. No, the captain said, not that I know of. It was all right. She could get by with a slotted spoon. She looked for one and found it and also a vegetable peeler next to it. She tried the vegetable peeler on one of the potatoes. It was nice and sharp. She started peeling. She liked to peel long, hard, smooth Idaho potatoes like this. These were going to make good French fries. She let the peels shoot into the sink, so when she got done, she could scoop them out with her hand. What will you do after you get to Florida, she said to the captain. Just keep going, probably, he said. A flame came up from the hibachi, and she could see his face suddenly in the light. It looked tired. Just keep going where, she asked. South, he said. There's a town where I used to live in Mexico, down on the Bay of Campeche. I'd like to go back there for a while and see if some people I used to know are still around. What were you doing there? Building a boat. This boat? No, a boat that never got finished, he said. Everything went wrong. He poked the charcoal in the hibachi with the edge of a grate. With boats, you always get seven kinds of trouble at once, he said. The keel was done and the frames were up. We were ready to start planking, and the government declared the forest we were in to be Veda, I think they called it, meaning no more wood. We went to Campeche for some more wood, paid for it. It never got sent. No way for a foreigner to sue them in Mexico. They knew that. Then all our fastenings from Mexico City disappeared. The paint got delivered, but it disappeared after we put some on a dinghy. Who's we? Lila asked, me and the boat carpenter. While she peeled the potatoes, the captain came down the ladder. He lit the kerosene lamp, then turned off the electric lights, then took out some glasses from a shelf, then opened the ice box. He filled the glasses with ice, opened the mix, and poured it. When he poured the whiskey, he held up her glass, and she told him when to stop. And then he said, here's to Pancho Piquet. Lila drank. It tasted fine. She showed him the peeled potatoes. I'm so starved I could eat them raw, she said, but I'm not going to. She found a cutting board and started to cut the potatoes, first the long way, making them into ovals, and then cutting them again into pencil-thick sticks. Beautiful knife, really sharp. The captain stood watching her. Who's Pancho Piquet, she asked. The Carpintero de Ribera. He was an old Cuban. He spoke Spanish so fast, even the Mexicans had trouble understanding him. Looked like Boris Karloff, didn't look Cuban or Mexican at all, but he was the fastest carpenter I've ever seen, the captain said, and careful, he never slowed down, even in that jungle heat. We didn't have any electricity, but he could work faster with hand tools than most people do with power tools. He was in his 50s or 60s, and I was 20-something. He used to smile, that Boris Karloff smile, watching me try to keep up with him. So why are we drinking to him? Lila asked. Well, they warned me, el dome, he drinks. And so he did, the captain said. One night, a big norte, a norther, blew in off the Gulf of Mexico, and it blew so hard, oh, it was a big wind. Almost bent the palm trees to the ground, and it took the roof off of his house and carried it away. But instead of fixing it, he got drunk and stayed drunk for more than a month. After a couple of weeks, his wife had to come begging for money for food. That was so sad. 
I think partly he got drunk because he knew everything was going wrong and the boat would never get built. And that was true. I ran out of money and had to quit. So that's why we're drinking to him, Lila said. Yeah, he was sort of a warning, the captain said. Also, he opened my eyes a little to something, a feeling for what the tropics is really like. All this talk about going to Florida and Mexico brought him back to mind. The potato sticks were growing into a mountain. She was making way too many, but it didn't matter. Better to have too many than too few. What do you want to go back there for, she said. I don't know. There's always that feeling of despair down there. I can feel it now just thinking about it. Triste tropique, the anthropologist Levi Strauss called it. It keeps pulling you back somehow. Mexicans know what I mean. There's always this feeling that the sadness is the real truth about things, and it's better to live with the sad truth than with all the happy progress talk you get up here in the north. So you're going to stay down in Mexico? No, not with a boat like this. This boat can go anywhere. Panama, China, India, Africa. No firm plans. You never know what will turn up. The potatoes were all cut. So how do I turn the stove on then? She asked the captain. I'll light it for you, he said. Why don't you teach me? said Lila. It takes too long, the captain said. While the captain was pumping up the stove, she finished her drink, freshened up his, and poured another for herself. She went up on deck to watch the vachi, and she set the pot on the stove and filled it with the entire bottle of oil they purchased at the supermarket, and then put on the lid. That oil would take a while to heat up. She took the steaks out of the supermarket wrappers to sprinkle them with salt and pepper. In the golden lamplight, they looked gorgeous. The pepper worked, but the salt shaker was clogged. She took the lid off and whacked it on the chart table, but the holes still were clogged, so she pinched a hunk of salt with her fingers and dusted it on that way. She handed up the steaks to the captain. Then she got to work on the salad, shredding piles of lettuce into two plates and using that sharp knife to slice a tomato. As she worked, she stuffed some hunks of lettuce in her mouth. Oh, 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 she said. What's the matter? he asked. I forgot how hungry I was. I don't know how you can stand it, going on like this without any food all day long. How do you do it? Well, actually, I had breakfast, he said. You did? Before you got up. Why didn't you wake me up? Your friend Richard Regal didn't want you along. Lila looked up through the hatchway at the captain for a long time. He was looking at her to see what she would say. Richard does that sometimes, she said. He probably thought we were going to have lunch somewhere. He really had it in for Richard, she thought. And he was trying to get her mad again. He wouldn't leave it alone. On a nice night like this, you'd think he'd leave it alone. It was such a nice night. She could feel the booze coming on. If you want me to go to Florida with you, I'll go with you, Lila said. He didn't say anything. He just poked the steak with a fork. What do you think, she said. I'm not sure. Why are you not sure? I don't know. I can cook and fix your clothes and sleep with you, Lila said. And when you're tired of me, you can just say goodbye and I'll be gone. How do you like that? He still didn't say anything. It was getting very hot in the cabin, so she lifted her sweater to take it off. You really need me, you know, she said. When she got the sweater off, she could see he'd been watching her take it off, with that special look. She knew what that meant. Here it comes, she thought. The captain said, What I was thinking about this afternoon while you were sleeping was that I want to ask you some questions that will help me fit some things together. What kind of questions? I don't know yet, he said, about what you like and don't like mainly. Well, sure, we can do that, too. He said, I thought maybe I could ask you questions about what your attitudes are about certain things, what your values are and how you got them, things like that. I'd really like to ask questions and jot down answers without really knowing where it's going to lead to and then later maybe try to put something together. Sure, Lila said, what kind of questions? He's going for it, she thought. She saw his glass was just about empty. She reached up through the hatchway and got it and then filled it. What holds a person together is his patterns of likes and dislikes, he said. And what holds a society together is a pattern of likes and dislikes. And what holds the whole world together is a pattern of likes and dislikes. History is just abstracted from biography. And so are all the social sciences. In the past, anthropology has been centered around collective objects. I've just had feelings that maybe the ultimate truth about the world isn't history or sociology, but biography, he said. She didn't know what he was talking about. All she could think of was Florida. She handed him up his glass. 
The blue flame of the stove was hissing away under the oil. She lifted the lid on the pot and saw the heat stirring the liquid inside, but it was so dark she couldn't really tell if it was time to start the potatoes. You're sort of another culture, he said, a culture of one. A culture is an evolved static pattern of quality, capable of dynamic change. That's what you are. That's the best definition of you that's ever been invented. You may think everything you say and everything you think is just you, but actually the language you use and the values you have are a result of thousands of years of cultural evolution. It's all in a kind of debris of pieces that seem unrelated, but are actually part of a huge fabric. Levi Strauss postulates that a culture can only be understood by reenacting its thought process with the debris of its interaction with other cultures. Does this make any sense? I'd like to record the debris of your own memory and try to reconstruct things with it. She wished she had a frying thermometer. She broke off a bit of potato and dropped it in the pot. It swirled slowly, but didn't sizzle. She fished it out and had another bite of lettuce. Have you ever heard of Heinrich Schleimann, he asked. Heinrich who? He was an archaeologist who investigated the ruins of a city people thought was mythological, ancient Troy. Before Schleiman used what he called this stratigraphic technique, archaeologists were just educated grave robbers. He showed how you could dig down carefully through one stratum after another, finding the ruins of earlier cities under later ones. That's what I think can be done with a single person. I can take parts of your language and your values and trace them to old patterns that were laid down centuries ago and are what make you what you are. I don't think you'll get much out of me, Lila said. The booze is really getting to him, she thought. All day he's been so quiet, now you can't shut him off. She said, boy, I sure pushed a button when I asked about going to Florida with you. What do you mean? All day I thought you were one of those silent types. Now I can't get a word in. He looked like she'd hurt his feelings. Well, I don't mind, she said. You could ask me all the questions you want. Finally, the oil looked hot enough. She used a slotted spoon to lower the first batch into the pot with a roar of bubbles and a cloud of steam. Are the steaks getting close to done, she asked. A few minutes more. Good, she said. The smell of the steaks mixed with the french fries coming up from the stove was making her almost faint. She couldn't remember when she'd ever been this hungry before. When the potato bubbles quieted down, she spooned the potatoes out, spread them on a towel, and showered them with salt, then put in the next batch. When these were done, she waited until the captain said the steaks were ready. Then she handed the plates up for him. She shook the french fries onto them from the paper towel. The captain came down. They opened the dining table leaves, moved the plates and whiskey mix and extra french fries onto the table, and suddenly, there everything was. She looked at the captain, and he looked at her. It could be like this every night, she thought. Oh, the steak was so good she wanted to cry. The french fries. Oh, salad. You don't know what this is doing to me, she said. What is it doing? He had a little smile on his face. Is this one of your questions, she asked. Her mouth was full of french fries. She had to slow down. No, he laughed. That wasn't one of them. I just wanted to know more about your background. Like a job interviewer, she asked. Well, yes, that's a start. She got up and refilled her glasses. She thought for a while. I was born in Rochester. I was the youngest of two girls. Is that the kind of stuff you want to know? Just a second. He got up and got a notepad and a pen. You mean you're going to write all this down? Sure, he said. Oh, forget it. Why? I don't want to do that. Why not? Let's just eat and relax and be friends. He frowned a little, then shrugged his shoulders, got up again, and put the pad of slips away. As she took another bite of the steak, she thought that maybe she shouldn't have said that. Not if she wanted to go to Florida. Go ahead. Ask some questions anyway, she said. I'll talk. I like to talk. The captain handed her a drink to her, then sat down beside her. All right. What are the things you like best? Food. What else? More food. And after that? She thought for a while. Just what we're doing now. Did you see that light from the city across the bridge? All of a sudden, it was so beautiful. What else? Men, she laughed. What kind? Any kind. The kind that likes me. What do you dislike most? Mean people, like that lady in the store back in town. There's a million people like her, and I hate every one of them. Always trying to make themselves big by tearing someone else down. You do it too, you know. Me? Yes, you. When? This afternoon, talking so big about a boat you never saw. Oh, that. Just don't be mean like that, and we'll get along fine. I only get mad at mean people. What after mean people, the captain said. 
People who think they're better than you are. What next? Lots of things. What? Well, there are lots of things I don't want. I don't want to get old. I don't want people to be mean. Oh, I said that. She thought for a while. Sometimes I don't want to be so lonely, you know? I thought George and me were really going to make it. And then this Debbie comes along. And it's like he doesn't even know me. I didn't do anything to him. That's just mean. Anything else? Isn't that enough? It isn't any special thing that makes me feel bad. I don't know what it's going to be until it happens. She looked at him. Sometimes there's something that just comes over me and I get scared. That happened this afternoon. What? When you started the engine. That was bad wind, he said. It wasn't just the wind. It wasn't like anything. It's like a storm coming and I don't have any house. I don't have anywhere to go. She took another bite of steak. I like this boat. Do you have storms on this boat? Yes, but the boat's like a cork. The waves wash over it. That's good. I like that. Why are you all alone like this on the river? I'm not. I'm with you. Well, then last night. I wasn't alone, she laughed. Don't you remember? She reached over and put her hand on his cheek. Don't you remember? Before you met me. Before I met you, I wasn't alone for five minutes. I was with that bastard George, don't you remember? All spring I saved money so I could take this trip with him. And then he runs off like that. They wouldn't even give me my money back. Oh, hell, let's not talk about him. He's all gone. Where were you going to go? Florida. Oh, the captain said. So that's why you want to go with me to Florida. Uh-huh, she said. While he thought about it, she started on her salad. Don't ever do this to me again, she said. Let's just fill this whole boat with groceries, okay? Somehow you didn't answer my question, he said. Before you met me, before you knew George, why weren't you married? I was married, Lila said, a long time ago. You're divorced. No. You're still married. No. He got killed. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Don't be. The steak was cooked perfectly, but it needed just a little bit more pepper. She reached over and got the pepper shaker by the cutting board and added just a pinch to the steak and then handed the shaker to the captain. That was a long time ago, she said. I never think about him. What did he do? He drove a truck. He was on the road most of the time. I never saw him much. And then one night, he didn't come home and the police called and said he was dead. And that was it. What did you do then? I got some insurance money. And then they had a funeral and I wore a black dress and all that, but I don't think about that anymore. Why didn't you like him? The captain said. We always had fights, Lila said. About what? Just fights. He was always suspicious of me, of what I was going to do when he wasn't home. He thought I was cheating on him. Were you? She looked at him. Wait a minute. When I was married, I was married. I didn't do anything like that. Don't get me mad. I'm just asking, the captain said. She had another bite of the salad. He never had respect for me. Why did you marry him? I was pregnant, Lila said. How old were you? Sixteen, seventeen when she was born. That's too young, the captain said. Those drinks before dinner were making her high now. She'd better slow down, she thought, and watch herself, and not do something dumb like she usually did when she got drunk. She was already talking too much. She felt dizzy, and then she saw the lamp swing. What's that, she said. Awake, the captain said. A big one. That's the first one, and the second they'll be, here it comes. Another even bigger wave came, and the whole boat rocked. And then after a while, a smaller one, another one, each one getting smaller. The captain got up from the table and went up. What is it, she said. I don't know, he said. It's not a barge. Some powerboat, probably. He may be on the other side of the bridge. He stood there for a long time, looking around inside. Then he looked back down at her. How old is your baby now, he asked. That surprised her. That was a new one. What do you want to know that for? I already told you before I started asking all these questions, he said. She's dead. How did she die, he asked. I killed her, she said. She watched his eyes. She didn't like them. He looked mean. Oh, you mean accidentally, he said. I didn't cover her right, and she smothered, Lila said. That was long ago. Nobody blamed you, though. Nobody had to. What could they say that I didn't already know? Lila remembered she still had the black funeral dress. She remembered she had to wear it three times that year. There were hundreds of people who came to her grandfather's funeral because he was a minister, and lots of Jerry's friends came to his funeral, but nobody came for Dawn. Don't get me started thinking about that, she said. 
She sat back in the berth for the first time and stopped eating. Ask some other questions, she said, like how long will it take to get to Florida? So you never married again, the captain said. No, God, no, never. I would never do that again. These people get married, she said. It's the cheapest trick on a person there is. You're supposed to give up all your freedom and everything just for sex every night. That doesn't make them happy. They're always looking around for some way out. Don't you want some more of these french fries? I just want to be free, she said. That's what America's about, isn't it? The captain took some french fries and she got up and took her plate over to the cutting board and took the rest of the french fries and put them on her plate. Give me your glass, she said. He gave it to her and she lifted the lid of the ice box and scooped some more ice into it. She added mix and booze and then filled her own glass. She saw the booze was halfway down the label already. When she heard a clunk, it was against the side of the boat. Now what, she said. The captain shook his head. He said, maybe a big branch or something. He got up and went past her and up on deck, and she felt the boat tip a little as his footsteps went over to the side. What is it, she said. It's the dinghy. After a while, he said, it's never done that before. Come on up and help me put some fenders down and tie it alongside. We'll bring it up in the morning. She came up and watched him make two big rubber fenders and tied them to the rail so they dangled over the side. He went over to the other side of the deck and came back with a long boat hook. She stood next to him while he reached out with the hook and brought the dinghy up against the side of the boat. Hold it there, he said, and gave her the boat hook. He went to a big box by the mast and opened it and took out a rope and then came back. He dropped the rope into the dinghy and then stepped and lowered himself down over the guardrail. She looked around. It was so quiet here. Just the rolling of cars across the bridge. The sky was still, all orange from the light from the city, but it was so peaceful. You would never guess where they were. When he was done, the captain grabbed the guardrail and pulled himself up again. I figured it out, he said. It's because the tide is changing. This is the first time I've seen this. Look around at all the other boats. You remember when we came, they were all pointed toward the bridge? Now they're all skewed around. She looked and saw that all the boats were facing different directions. They'll probably be all pointing away from the bridge after a while. It's warm enough out. Let's sit up here and watch it. I'm sort of fascinated by this, he said. Lila brought up the bottles and ice and some sweaters and a blanket to put over them. She sat next to him and put the blanket over their legs together. Listen to how quiet it is, she said. It's hard to believe we're this close to New York. They listened for a long time. What are you going to do when you get to Manhattan, the captain said. I'm going to find a friend of mine and see if he can help me, she said. What if you can't find him? I don't know. I could do a lot of things. Get a job waitressing or something like that. She looked at him, but couldn't see how he took it. Who is this person you're going to see in New York? Jamie? He's just an old friend. How long have you known him? Oh, two or three years, she said. In New York? Yes. So you've lived there a long time? Not so long, Lila said. I always liked it there. You can be anyone you want in New York, and no one will stop you. She suddenly thought of something. You know what? I bet you'd like him, too. You'd get along fine with him. He's a sailor, too. He worked on a ship once. You know what, Lila said? He could help us sail the boat to Florida, if you wanted to, I mean. I mean, I could cook, and he could steer, and you could... Well, you could just give all the orders. The captain stared into his glass. Just think about it, Lila said. Just the three of us going down to Florida. After a while, she said, he's really friendly. Everybody likes him. She waited a long time, but the captain didn't answer. She said, if I could talk him into it, would you take him? I don't think so, the captain said. But three's too many. That's because you haven't met him, Lila said. She took the captain's glass and filled it again and snuggled up to him to keep warm. He just wasn't used to the idea. Give him some time, she thought. The cars rolled over the bridge one after another. Bright headlights went in one direction and red taillights went in the other, on and on. You remind me of someone, Lila said, someone I remember from a long time ago. Who? I can't remember. What did you do in high school? Not much, he said. Were you popular? No. You were unpopular. Nobody paid much attention to me one way or the other. Weren't you on any teams? The chess team. You went to dances? No. Then where'd you learn to dance? I don't know. I went for a couple of years to dancing school, the captain said. Well, what else did you do in high school? I studied. In high school? I was studying to be a chemistry professor. 
You should have studied to be a dancer. You were really good last night. Suddenly Lila knew who he reminded her of. Sidney Shadar. You're not much of a ladies' man, are you? No, not at all, he said. This person wasn't either. Chemistry's not bad if you're into it, he said. It's kind of exciting. I and another kid got the key to the school building and sometimes would come back at 10 or 11 at night and go into the chemistry laboratory and work on chemistry experiments till dawn. Sounds weird. No, actually, it was pretty great. What did you do? Adolescent stuff, the secret of life. I was working hard on that. You should have stuck to dancing, Lila said. That's the secret of life. I was sure I was going to find it, studying proteins and genetics and things like that. Really weird. Is that what this other person was like? Sydney? Yes, I guess so. He was a real nerd. Oh, the captain said. And I remind you of him? You both talk the same way. He used to ask a lot of questions, too. He always had a lot of big ideas. What was he like? Nobody liked him much. He was very smart, and he was always trying to tell you about things you weren't interested in. What did he talk about? Who knows? There was just something about him that made everybody mad at him. He didn't really do anything bad. He just, I don't know what it was. He just didn't, he was smart, but at the same time, he was dumb. And you could never see how dumb he was because he thought he knew everything. Everyone used to call him Sad Sack. And I remind you of him? Yes. If I'm such a nerd, why did you dance with me last night? The captain asked. You asked me. I thought you asked me. Maybe I did, Lila said. I don't know. You look different, maybe. They all look different at first. You know, Sydney was really smart, Lila said. About two years ago, I was sitting at a table in this restaurant, and I looked up, and there he was, much older, and he had glasses on, and he was getting bald. He's a pediatrician now. He's got four children now. He was really nice. He said, hello, Lila, and we talked a long time. What did he say? He just wondered how I was and everything. Was I married? And I said, no, the right one hasn't come along yet. And he laughed at me and said, someday he will. You see what I mean, Lila said. She excused herself and went down to the bathroom. On her way back, she had to hang on to things to keep steady. It didn't matter. She wasn't going anywhere. She sat down again next to the captain, and he asked, How long have you known Richard Regal? Since the second grade, she said. The second grade? Surprised, huh? God, I'll say, I had no idea. He arranged the blanket neatly and settled back and then looked up at the sky. There was so much light from the city there weren't any stars at all. It was just all orange and black, like Halloween. Phew, the captain said. What's the matter? I'm just sort of shook, he said. The second grade? That's just unbelievable. Why is it unbelievable? You mean he used to sit behind you and make faces at the teacher and things like that? No, we were just in the same class. Why does that seem so unbelievable? I don't know, the captain said. He doesn't seem like the sort of person who would have a childhood but I suppose he must have. We were good friends, Lila said. You were childhood sweethearts? No, we were just friends. We've always been friends. I don't see why you're surprised at that. Why, out of a whole classroom full of people, would you pick a person like him for a friend? He came in at the second grade, and I was the only one who was nice to him. The captain shook his head. After a while, he made a sound like, You don't know him, Lila said. He was very quiet and shy. He used to stutter. Everybody laughed at him. He sure doesn't stutter now, the captain said. You don't know him. So you went all the way through grade school and high school with him. No, after sixth grade he went to prep school, and I didn't see him much. What does his father do? I don't know. They were divorced. He lived in New York somewhere. Or I think Kingston, maybe. Where we were last night. Well, I guess what's bothering me, the captain said, is if you've known him since the second grade and you're such good friends, why was he so down on you last night? Richard likes me, said Lila. No, not true, the captain said. That's what's getting me. Why was he so rude to you? Why wouldn't he talk to you last night? Oh, that's a long story, Lila said. Last night he didn't even say hello. I know, that's just the way he is. He just doesn't approve of the way I live. Well, that's true, the captain said. Lila held up the bottle and showed it to the captain. You know something? What? I think we are getting a little smashed. At least I am. You're not drinking very much. But something's still missing, the captain said. What? You never saw him after prep school. 
I saw plenty of him after prep school. You mean he used to go out with you? Everybody used to go out with me, Lila said. You don't know what I was like. I wish you could have seen me when I was younger. I had such a cute figure. It sounds like I'm bragging, but it was true. I don't look like so much now, but you should have seen me back then. Everybody wanted to go out with me. I was popular then. I was really popular. So you went out with him. Sometimes we'd go out together, and then his mother found out, and she made him stop. Why? Well, you know why. She is very rich, and I'm not in their social class. Also, women don't approve of people like me, especially mothers with little sons who are interested in me. The booze was hitting really hard now. She had to stop. Anyway, Richard's a nice guy, she said. The captain didn't say anything. And you aren't, she added. Regal said you got someone named Jim in trouble. Did he talk about that? Lila shook her head. What was that all about? Oh, God, I wish he hadn't talked about that. What was it about? Nothing. We weren't doing anything. Anything worse than you and me are doing on this boat right now. I told Jim never to tell anyone about us. Then he went and told Richie, and Richie told his mother, and his mother told Jim's wife. That's when all the trouble started. Oh, God, what a mess that was. All because Richie's mother couldn't leave us alone. His mother? Look, Richie dotes on his mother, morning, noon, and night. That's where he gets all his money. I think he sleeps with her. She really hates me, Lila said. Why did Regal's mother hate you? I told you. She was afraid I was going to take her little Richie away from her. And she was the one who got Jim's wife to hire the detectives. Detectives? We were in the motel and they pounded on the door and I told Jim, don't answer it. But he didn't listen. He said, I'll just talk to them. Sure. That's all they wanted. Just to talk. Oh, he was so dumb. It was just awful. As soon as he opened the door, they came in with flash cameras and took pictures of everything. Then they wanted him to sign a confession. They said they wouldn't prosecute if he just signed. You know what he did? He signed. He wouldn't listen to me. If he'd listened to me, there's nothing they could have done. They didn't have a warrant or anything. Then they left, and you know what Jim did? He started to cry. That's what I remember most, him sitting on the edge of the bed with his big eyes full of tears. I was the one who should have been crying. And what do you suppose he was crying about? About how he didn't want his wife to divorce him. Oh, he made me so disgusted. He made everybody disgusted. He was weak. He always complained about how she ran his life, but he really wanted her to. That's why he wanted to go back. They always talk about how they're going to leave their wives, but they never do. They always go back. Did his wife take him back? No, she wasn't dumb. She took his money instead, almost $100,000. She couldn't stand him any more than I could after that. Did you see Jim after that? For a while, but I never respected him after that. And he got fired from the bank, and I got tired of him. And I met this friend from New York, Jamie, and I came down here with him for a while. I thought Regal said he was Jim's lawyer. He was, but after they got the pictures and the confession, there wasn't much he could do. Why did he take the case? Because of me. I'm the one who told Jim to go to him. The captain made a sound again. He tipped his head back and looked at the sky. He didn't say anything for a long time. He just stared up in the sky like he was looking for some stars. There aren't any stars up there, Lido said. I already looked. Is Regal married? The captain asked. No. Why not? I don't know. He's all messed up just like everybody else. You know something? What? You're not drinking as much as I am. She held a bottle up to the sky and looked at it. And you know something else? What? I'm not going to answer any more of your questions. Why not? You're the detective. That's what you are. You think you're going to learn something. I don't know what, but you're not going to learn anything. You'll never find out who I am because I'm not anything. What do you mean? I'm not anybody. All those questions you're asking are just a waste of time. I know you're trying to find out what kind of person I am, but you're never going to find out anything because there's nothing to know. Her voice was getting slushy. She could tell it was getting slushy. I mean, I used to play. I was this kind of person and that kind of person. But then I got so tired of playing all these games. It's such work and it doesn't do any good. There's just all these pictures of who I am and they don't hold together. They're all different people I'm supposed to be, but none of them are me. I'm not anybody. I'm not here. Like you now. I can see you've got a lot of bad impressions about me in your mind and you think that's what's in your mind. And you think that what's in your mind is what you're talking to, but nobody is here. You know what I mean? Nobody's home. That's Lila. 
nobody's home. You know what? Father said, what? What you want to do is make me into something I'm not. Just the opposite. You think it's just the opposite, but you're really trying to do something to me that I don't like. What's that? You're trying to, you're trying to destroy me. No. Yes. Well, you've completely misunderstood what I'm asking you these questions for, the captain said. No, I haven't. I've completely understood it just exactly right, Lila said. All men do that. You're no big exception. Jerry did it. Every man does it. But you know something? It won't work. I'm not trying to destroy you, he said. That's what you think. You're just playing around the edges, aren't you? You can't get to the center of me. You don't even know where the center of me is. That set him back. You're not a woman. You don't know. When men make love, they're really trying to destroy you. A woman's got to be real quiet inside because if she shows a man anything, they'll try to kill it. But they all get fooled because there's nothing to destroy but what's in their own mind. And so they destroy that. And then they hate what's left. And they call what's left a Lila. And they hate Lila. But Lila isn't anybody. That's true. You don't believe it, but it's true. Women are very deep, Lila said. But men never see it. They're too selfish. They always want women to understand them. And that's all they ever care about. That's why they always have to try to destroy them. I'm just asking questions, the captain said. Fuck your questions. I'm whatever your questions turn me into. You don't see that. It's your questions that make me who I am. If you think I'm an angel, then that's what I am. If you think I'm a whore, then that's what I am. I'm whatever you think. And if you change your mind about me, then I change too. So whatever Richard tells you, it's true. There's no way he can lie about me. Lila took the bottle and took a swig down straight. To hell with glasses, she said. Everybody wants to turn Lila into somebody else. And most women put up with that because they want the kids and the money and the good-looking clothes. But it won't work with me. I'm just Lila, and I always will be. And if men don't like me the way I am, then men can just get out. I don't need them. I don't need anyone. I'll die first. That's just the way I am. After a while, Lila looked around and saw that all the boats were lying straight in line, just like the captain said they would be. That's pretty good. He'd figure that out. She told him about it. He didn't say anything. He hadn't said anything for a long time. A bad feeling was starting to creep up. He wasn't drinking. Was he getting mad? That's what happens when you don't keep up drinking. You get mad. She was talking too much. Sober up, Lila, before it's too late. Hang on. Sober up. You know what? Lila said. What? I'm really sick of talking about me. Let's talk about something else. It's getting cold out here, the captain said. He got up. I didn't get any real sleep last night, he said. I'm going to bed early. Lila got up and followed him into the cabin. He went down into the bunk at the front of the boat, and she could hear him lie down. And then he was quiet. She looked around the cabin. All this food and things to put away. What a mess. Suddenly she remembered the chocolate pudding never got made. She would probably never get to eat it, she thought. 